Yes, greetings, everyone. Welcome back once again to Five Points International here with your host, Corey Harris. We are interviewing the movers and shakers in the African world. Want to remind you to please like, share, and subscribe because that helps YouTube know that there are people out there that appreciate the content. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest today. We have with us the good brother, musician, teacher, Mausiki Scales. How are you, brother? I'm doing excellent. And yourself? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Yeah. Thank you so glad, much. Glad to be, be here. Glad yeah, it's good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. We were talking about the banjo lesson. That's a powerful yeah. reference you have behind you. Oh, indeed. Indeed. So I guess we could start off reflecting on the banjo. But um, my father-in-law, James Stewart, he's a collector, Dr. James Stewart. And we were blessed to have this. I, I get to be blessed to be married to his, his daughter. <laughs> That's and true. this as a part of um, their art collection, or our art collection. Oh. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that says a lot. You know, that's a real transmission event right there. You know, very powerful. Indeed. Mm -hmm. I, I think of um, Joplin's work. I mean, Scott Joplin being a pianist and his parents having that background of, of the fiddle as well as the banjo. You could hear that in his playing, that mm -hmm. precursor to jazz in the 1890s coming through and you hear that percussive element, that drone yes. and uh, sharing that with you feels like I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, you know, it's, uh, there's so much information, you know, that we can't be thinking about it all the time. So it's always good to be reminded, you know. This is true. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's amazing. You, you say the banjo and the fiddle and really that's, that's our foundational music. Like that's, right so important to us and it's it's so amazing to see or experience people's associations with those instruments today they don't associate we don't associate those instruments true. With ourselves so i mean that those instruments are so important you know when as i study our history our story you think about all of our ancestors that came from Africa into the Americas, to Brazil, the Caribbean, Central and South America, and to this part of the South. I'm currently in Atlanta. And to think about Africa, we first think about the drum. So, but this first collective music we create is a string based instrument. And it takes me back to that moment in 1739, just outside of Charleston in Stono, South Carolina where this, there's this rebellion by Jimmy and among some other Angolans. And after that comes the suppression of the drum, the attempted suppression of the drum. And here now comes to the forefront as we read in many of the narratives of our enslaved Africans, our captive ancestors, these stories about the fiddle and these stories about the banjo becoming you know, central to our experience or to use Baba Amiri Baraka's term blue, we become blues people, right? We were blues people. And that music begins to be reflected in this ethos where we come to be rejuvenated while the world around us is trash. We come into those spaces to be renewed. And the other important thing about that, those moments is it was always meant to be private. So I'm fascinated now watching all these YouTube videos People give commentary, this is the secret to this instrument and what have you, when those were the secret order of African quarters. Yes, yes. It's very true, because now in this hyper-capitalist post-industrial time, nothing is sacred. Everything's for sale, for dissection, for market, you know? Right. So, yeah, it's uh, fascinating. And I've thought about that a lot, you know, like really during the pandemic, I had time to think about the impulse behind our music why are we compelled and the original impulse was not capitalism it wasn't to make money right. there was no market for it not at all you know not at all. So, i mean that, that that's such a, a telling um comment in that when joplin's piece i believe it's maple leaf rag that piece gets put into sheet music we now see these german they call themselves composers when they were really just putting to print Joplin's compositions, um, we see them making, selling over a million copies. 
And now this music begins to be something different than minstrelsy. Minstrelsy was still a big money maker. The 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 um what did they, they call it? The drum major would come into the town center and let everybody know there's a show tonight. And then in those places we see four white men dressed in blackface making mockery uh, of African music, even making that experience starting in the early 19th century, making it all the way into early Hollywood with um, with blackface and now later black people imitating those who were imitating our people to begin with in blackface mm -hmm. and there has to be trauma associated with that imitating the imitator imitating you oh. you know delivering your music and and one of the challenges i feel with that as a musician is that i feel accountable to those ancestors to give some agency to those ancestors voices that didn't get a chance to say this is mine this is the music in its proper context and when we did those things privately it was so dynamic it had the ashe in it and as it began to be about the european gaze the entire intent and feeling is out of the window hmm. yeah you you said a whole lot you said a whole lot it's so <laughs> true you know yeah what about the connection between the blues and our sacred center, our spirituality? Because as it's marketed and, and really even as it's discussed among ourselves, it's viewed as something low down, dirty gut right. bucket, you know? Yeah. But you know, you and I know that there is a spiritual core to it I mean, you listen to those old blues artists, it's like every other word is, oh, Lord. Right. Speak on that. I mean, I think that I feel like that that the old blues tradition, and when I say blues, I'm even mentioning the, the gospel, the, the spirituals, that that even that note blue, that word blue note is, is a bit troubling to me because we know that this scale came with us across the Atlantic Ocean, that these were notes that were foreign to the European and they had to be labeled. But that idea of the musicians that were playing in the juke joint on Friday and Saturday night, also waking up Sunday morning and playing in, in quote unquote sacred spaces, all of this is coming from the same expression that in the, the so-called sacred aspect of that, there's a redemptive element there. There's this mm -hmm. space that we're going to, to be mm -hmm. redeemed. And interestingly, in all of those spaces, the, the aesthetic is the same that we, we ain't speaking, you know, white folks English, whether that's the spirituals, um, or whether that's the blues, or whether that's hip hop. We're using our language. There's an element of self determination within our space. There's the idea that the world is going awry while we get to come back into these spaces and edify oneself to yes. to, to to build ourselves up. So the sun gonna shine through my back door someday ha has the same redemptive element that we see um, with quote unquote religious folks. But the interesting part about that as it relates to families, how I see that in my family is it's not sacred unless it's about Jesus, unless it's about Sunday morning, unless it's strictly within this, this Christian element. But something that moves us so deeply that creates trance, that creates escapism and it's interesting to see that theme because you know i like parliament funkadelic like you know my mama raised me right <laughs> and in parliament you have this idea of a mothership and they got the idea from the mothership taking us away from this oppression the same thing with sunrise orchestra in the 1950s he said that he wanted us to escape to this intergalactic egypt free of oppression and he began to use his sound to transport us there. You hear Arrested Development, Take Me to Another Place, um, Bob Marley, The Exodus. We know something is wrong here, even if it's you know anywhere else other than this cotton field, anywhere else other than this sugarcane field. And for the blues man, you see that with the train, like, you know, going to Kansas City, no, you can't come with me. This idea that we're looking for our freedom, even if it's temporary freedom, even if it's in our imagination, there's a destination there. And at early on, of course, 
steal away to Jesus was coded for steal away to the slave ship Jesus so we can go back to our holy land and then anywhere else other than than here became the theme so to see that spirit of exodus regardless of the quote genre it speaks to it speaks to our experience sometimes i feel like a motherless child a long way from home hmm. home originally being the motherland home next being heaven and then any place other than here so that hmm. redemptive element and all that tension that we feel i feel it in my family that that music is considered to be of a lower dispensation the blues afro beat funk you know what you're all doing with all of that whereas why don't you play something a bit more elevated and i think that that's buying into some other folks consciousness about things that should be sacred to us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh huh yeah <laughs> very true <laughs> If 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 you take the fiddle away from Bro Rabbit, he might just turn up and die. And mm -hmm. LL said, "I can't live without my radio." Mm -hmm. So how could it not be sacred if it's if it's our lifeline? It gave mm -hmm. us a lifeline mm -hmm. in the darkest hour, and it continues to be that for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that is the word. You know, in the beginning was the word. So it continues. Yeah. It makes me think what you were talking about. Um, makes me think of some things that the the good doctor greg carr was talking about he makes a distinction between social gov social structure and governance structure mm. when he's talking about governance he's meaning meaning what are we to each other how do we govern mm. ourselves you know and then social is what are we to the outer society but he right. makes those distinctions and it's very important that we make that distinction all the time. Like, who are we to each other? Why is that important? You know, mm. what do we have that is ours and why is it ours? Why is it important to keep it ours? You know, I mean, those exactly. basic questions. Um, Yeah, yeah. What, what, yeah. how do you think now when we look at the blues industry, jazz, we see a, a, a strong de-emphasis on it being African black music. Mm. Um, for example, when we look at the Blues Foundation website in Memphis, you know, they're very keen on de emphasizing the cultural element and emphasizing um, their view that anyone can do it and it's all the same. That is all the same genre, you know, if you're in that so-called style. What, right. what are your ideas on that? I, mean, I feel like that consciousness falls right into this idea that jazz is an original American art form, that blues is an original American art form. It, it reeks of historical amnesia, that when jazz emerges on the scene in the 1920s, it was not accepted whatsoever. It was considered music that would take us back to the jungle. It was considered uncivilized. And the standard of that music was created by, of, of music then was created by these, um, you know, white men that lived in the 17 and 1800s as the standard. So the fact that it's played differently every time, it was considered substandard. And um, you know, we see what took place with, with Tin Pan Alley up in the Northeast, that music became very cookie cutter and bebop musicians made it black again. They said, we're gonna bring this back to its roots. That is not, it, where's the element of soul? Where's the ritual element? And that is an element, you know, where we had dance involved with it, um, some agency about where it's played, how it's played, what's being said. And even within the names of some of those songs, it becomes this big ballroom American phenomena and rather than something uniquely ours. How can it be American music when the creators of the music weren't acknowledged as American citizens at the time of its creation? Mm -hmm. Whether that be jazz, whether that be blues, and all of the dynamics that we see in this, in this music are traceable, all of the expressions of it are traceable to Africa with mm -hmm. the very pillar itself being blue notes. The blue notes, the reason why there exists a name called blue notes has to do with uh, Europeans 
over assessing phenomena they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't blue to James Brown. They weren't blue to Bessie Smith, you know, Sunhouse. These notes were part of our language. And that's one unique thing about how African people express the music is an extension of the language and vice versa. You know, Mama Ella scatting um, like a trumpet and the trumpet and the mute and all of that imitating the human voice. And I, I feel as if looking at that narrative, when you see as early um, in the French world, you have this cold noir as early as 1685, doubling down again in 1724 in Louisiana, that is suppressing the drum, how African people express uh, we are looking at those blue notes themselves being associated with evil or the devil or the minor chord or the, the idea of repetition. All of those things that are unique to us being who it is that we are, we're practically outlawed. We see the same thing with the, um, the Black Code, um, the Negro Act that came in 1740 as a result of the drum being outlawed, as a result of Stono Rebellion. So all of that is shaping a certain consciousness. And then so from 1830 all the way through the early 20th century, you see the blues being made a mockery of through the minstrel tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're calling it coon songs and all of these, these type of things. So overnight, overnight in the 1900s, Elvis becomes the king. Overnight, after you have um, banned this music, after you have modified it and outlawed it and, and just called it straight out evil, all of a sudden everyone gains access to it. So it's very difficult for me to sign on to institutions and individuals that look at history and culture in that way. Mm -hmm. If you and I were to play music that came from China or Japan or you know some of these other areas for that matter, it would be associated with this land of origin. And I sometimes feel as if African people living in North America live in a house where people could come and go with our creative works and take credit for it. Uh, and, and understandably so, considering we are part of a legacy of enslaved Africans. We are the le their legacy. But what scholars are often guilty of, as well as lay historians and, and scholars, is of automatically placing Europeans at this hierarchy that whatever that they create, even when you read uh, major texts coming across the Atlantic, we are described as this charter generation. Where does the charter come from? It comes from Africa. And I hear other high tone individuals wanting to be proud to call this music uh, European or American when in fact it is African at its core, the element of swing, the element of repetition, mm -hmm. um, jazz improvisation, um, you know, all of that traceable to it, easily traceable to its African roots, even the language of what we call the music. Mm -hmm. uh, it tends to imitate the sound of the music itself. Hip hop, mm -hmm. bebop, right? It's an idiophone, mm -hmm. um, honky tonk. We are naming the music after the very uh, energy of the music that it sounds like, not unlike the word like zigzag. You know, it sounds like the very music that, that we're describing. So with, with all, it's so easily traceable. And, and when W.B. Du Bois says that we could trace our heritage socially all the way back to Africa, because we were also dealing in spaces that were primarily segregated, Europeans did not gain really full access until right around Joplin's time period, as his music gained popularity, there began to be that piano craze. And hey, this is something we have access to. And those composers tried to have him um, kind of dumb down or create a standardized song because he could play one song 25 different ways. They said, no, we need one, uh, one version of it that's palatable so we can make piano rolls and make it palatable to a, a widespread um, American audience. And, mm -hmm. and therein lies a turning point in, in the music that you're now beginning to perform for an audience rather than that music having its own utility mm -hmm. in our own sacred spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah, you touched upon uh, the connection between blues and minstrelsy that made me think of the good brother, Chris Thomas King. 
he wrote an article a few years ago where he was exploring that connection and, and talked about some things that I didn't know about or hadn't thought about in, in this way, namely that the blues represented the first time that we were able to express ourselves, control that economy and do it in our own language, in our own and control that expression, right. you know, because, you know, a lot of people don't know minstrelsy was a constructed idiom. It was white people who went down to plantations and observed what they heard. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. And no, then you're wrong. That, from that's, their, that's what I from know. From their too. limited understanding of what they heard, they proceeded to go back to New York or wherever and construct melodies and call that a representation of our music. And right. That's, yeah. That's I mean, it. Thomas Rice in the 1830s, taking black face paint, imitating someone, an African that he'd seen performing mu music, now begins to travel the Ohio River uh, in blackface. And it, it became lucrative for them too. They were making money uh, from this style and while making mockery over the music. And with ragtime comes that turning point of, we're gonna take this a bit more seriously. We see where this is, is viable. We can make more money. This music is having an impact in people's homes, the piano craze, people going out to buy a piano and buy pianos. And I think that in each of those moments where those things take place, it leaves African people to raise questions in our own spaces, that it seems as if um, in these other places where we went, Haiti and Cuba and, and Brazil, we were a majority in those spaces. And only 5% of Africans came to North America, where we were outnumbered in some spaces, like the Stono Rebellion, interestingly, we represented a majority in South Carolina. But I, I think you're right. And the idea of the juke joint or the, you know, these, the Chitlin circuit, this idea of, uh, along with the Negro League, we're in control of, of, of what's happening here, the control of the drinks, we are bringing money into our own community space. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's like, you know, when I hear us complaining about us not getting an award at the latest, you know, it's like, <laughs> we, we have already our structures in place, you know, right. we don't even need to talk about that. That's real. That's real. <laughs> yes. Truly, truly. Um, let me look at my questions here. Well, I wanted to talk about some things uh, that intrigued me in um, some of the uh, material that you sent me about water, the connection with our music and water. Because when I meditate on our history, you know, I'm always thinking about the Mississippi, um, the Nile, right? the Congo, the Joliba, the Niger, you know, and it's always our civilization, our culture is around rivers and bodies of water. If you could talk about that. Right. I mean, my earliest reference has to do with the, the river Nile, um, this river that flows over 4,000 miles from the south into, into the delta how sacred that was in one of our primordial civilizations of Nubia, Kemet, and Kush. And in terms of looking at our spaces in this part of the world, in the Americas, growing up in a home where my mother's from South Carolina and my father's from Arkansas, I would um, overhear my mother say certain things. Now, if you ask my mother what her religion is, she'd say, boy, you know, I'm a good Christian woman. But there are certain things that took place that was not in the Bible from Genesis all the way <laughs> to Revelation. She, uh, as well as the other mothers and women of the family, if someone said, well, I dreamt fish, immediately everyone's saying, well, well, somebody's pregnant. You know, some, someone is pregnant in these spaces. And they would take it just as seriously as any, any other fact that they realized. And after kind of taking a step back, looking at our, our spaces, the Atlantic as a body of water, but if we look all throughout like our West African ancestral traditions, uh, Sterling Stuckey, Baba Sterling Stuckey says that there's one thing that might be more important than death, and that is dying away from home. And when we look at the, the narratives of our enslaved ancestors, our captive ancestors, there's the idea that there's one person 
who I recall saying, if I could just spend one more moment in the finda, which is a Kikongo term coming from Mfinda, mm -hmm. he's, which is associated with the forest, but it also be the horizon on the sea or what they call like associated with the Kalunga. And so for many people in, in West Central Africa, to be submerged underwater is the idea of seeing your ancestors face to face. And so one would have to ask, it doesn't seem as if the, the Baptists did any major enslaving early, but what made our ancestors in this part of the world so attracted to river baptism and, 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 and creeks and that water being associated with transformation? There is a river, Baba Vincent Harding, Harding there is a river. So looking back into places like Ghana, as well as Nigeria, some of the largest rituals take place around bodies of water. The Oshun Festival is centered around that water. And that water from the Nile um, to the Oya River, or also the Niger River, this idea of us being used to transport and the association with the musician as being a traveling man. And spiritual, I, the spiritual concept of our music also being a riverway that clearly what comes before us has come down river to us. So we get, we get to be blessed with all of this talent that comes before us. And we too get to be a part of the river. Um, Fela Kuti says, water no good enemy. You know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even if water drowned your child, it mm -hmm. cannot be your enemy. And we know all throughout um, the continent uh, as a sign that you're welcome in a home water is offered as life as well as a seat as an indication that you're welcome so uh, water is something that i constantly pull on in in the spirit of inspiration also having um, a very deep connection with uh, spaces in ghana where rivers are, are very sacred spaces. There can, in fact, in the Congo, I think Baba Fukiao makes the reference that these represent like the, the spaces of our primordial ancestors. In fact, Simbi, Simbi spirits. So you got like Orisha, the Bosun, and Simbi spirits. And, and in um, some very important research that has emerged in the last 15 or 20 years, there is the idea of our ancestors even running away uh, from plantations to try to find uh, spirits that they can be in alignment with as it related to their freedom that are associated with these Simbi um, ancestral spirits. And not only were they important in Africa, they're important in waterways here, that um, the, the sacredness of the river, sacredness of water. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, the Igbo say, Water cleans all, but what cleans water? Hmm. <laughs> true, 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 yeah. true. Yeah, you know the uh, in Guinea they say water washes you, but culture keeps you clean. <laughs> yeah. I like that one too. <laughs> yeah. After I use it three times, I, I get I get to um, own it for myself. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. So. Yeah, switching gears to the present time now, we have this knowledge, we have this legacy. How do we employ this in the present time? Because from what I see, the artists that are in view across the genres, we are stepping very lightly. We're not addressing these issues head on like say a Fela Kuti or James Brown. Right. What do you, how do you account for that reticence, that fear? I think that the fear of seeing those who have gone ahead, uh, you know, being killed or being challenged or people wanting to eat, because I think that there is a space, one of the central words that I feel like is associated, that is associated with African music is this will to promote truth. And not just promote it, but the will to tell the truth. So whether, despite the genre, on the sacred, tell the truth, or even two chains, true, you know, the idea about authenticity, or at the Apollo, if you're not delivering something that is authentic, it's like, you got to go. So something mm -hmm. about being true and authentic is crucial, while at the same time, I think that uh, we are shifting gears more from 
what is in the best interest of the collective to what's in the best interest of the individual. You know, I think about bands and old school bands like Earth, Wind and Fire, the Commodores, Emotions, where this is a collective expression. And it seems as if we are more now in the age of the individual. I mean, the word selfie tells us so much about <laughs> this particular era uh, and the idea that those bands back then seemed like they were at least accountable to some community values, to some sort of standard, being in the shadow of the civil rights era, the black power era, that this was more than just words being shared. Um, even Fela Manu Dibango being popular at the time of, of you know, African independence, we're looking at people who were very brave with their political voice. And I think now, and even the last poets among others, that now there does seem to be uh, a, a lot of uh, the idea of being timid or being reserved with commentary about calling out the powers that be as as the evils that they are. Hmm. Yeah, I find that fascinating. Um, let's see. Well, we got just a couple more questions. I wanted to talk about briefly how has COVID now affected the music industry? You know, um, just in general, we were in like an inflection point in world history with this pandemic. Right. I heard a statistic somewhere around 500 billionaires were created in the past 18 months, something like that. Mm. So now what is the future for live music, for recorded music? How do you see it? It seems as if the, the streaming, even if we go fully back into live shows, that shows will continue to be streamed. I think that um, I've also seen communities become tighter in some spaces. Artists that I had not worked with before, um, having an opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to collaborate with them. Um, I was not set up to record at home before COVID. I would, I would always get you know, cats together and say, let's go to the studio. So it's brought that skill set um, to the fore for me. Where I'm like, okay, let's hook this microphone up and, and, and let's get it going at home. But I think, I do think that while the streaming is necessary, while we will continue to do shows, I prefer to do shows outside for, for health purposes. However, I think, I think something is being asked of us uh, of the moment. And I think it's tied to the question that you had before now too, mm -hmm. that when things become crucial, where do you stand? Mm -hmm. that, that are we willing to put that in the lyrics? Are we willing to speak truth to power? And are we willing to use whatever means that we have necessary mm -hmm. to make that, to make that happen? Mm -hmm. So, you know, with, 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 um, with the, the music, musicians that I've worked with, I've also found it a, a good time to remind us of what our original mission statement was. What is it that we seek to do? And coming back to perform after kind of being cold for just over a year, it feels, it feels empowering and it feels like we should be very responsible with the power that we have, with the microphone that we have, not different than our elders and, and ancestors who were blues men and women and spoke and were the the mouthpiece of their community speaking truth so I, I feel that responsibility and want to be accounted accountable to that as i move forward in this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah very true yeah so what do you have um in conclusion what do you have coming up that you want people to know about how can <clears throat> people get in touch with you also Okay, I, I released an album that actually did pretty well and is doing pretty well during, during lockdown last year. It's called West West Africa. Uh, West West Africa as a concept came from Hugh Matsukela, where when he came to Atlanta, he was able to, you know, at his concert, he shared this, uh, this concept that we were West West Africans, that we so con were connected with the music that we we just got it it needed no explanation and i embraced the term 
and created a, an album that is a vignette of creation stories about the diaspora. And they have one song that's doing really well, but the album was warmly received. I'm grateful for that. So please support if that's something that's within your interest. Uh, my website is malsikiscales.com. That is M-A-U-S-I-K-I scales, S-C-A-L-E-S dot com. It's also available on major streaming platforms. Before we completely sign off, I need to, to let you know that the conversation that you had with Ali Farka Torre has remained a part of, of my class and lessons that I, I've given now for years. It is so important for African people of diaspora to understand our connection, but I think that to also see the reverence that Baba Ali Farka Torre had to, to John Lee Hooker and toward the music that we've created in diaspora, while he said the narratives have changed and the, and the, the legacy in terms of the commentary has changed, rightfully so, the music is still African. And I think that it's empowering. One of my brothers from Ivory Coast saw that video. He made me, he's like, you have to send that to me. You have to send that to me. Uh, such, a, such an important dialogue that was taking place right mm -hmm. there. It's, it's been crucial to me in, in my development, a place that I return to, mm -hmm. to part mm -hmm. of my river. Give thanks, give thanks, brother. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, that, that's an experience that the two times that I spent with him, I guess it was a, maybe a combination of about two weeks total. It was, uh, I keep feeding off of that meal, you know, it just keeps mm -hmm. nourishing me and it just don't stop. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, wow. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Any anything else you'd like to share? Uh, thank you. I, I greatly appreciate you having me on to share, and looking forward to the next dialogue. Okay, brother. We are gonna keep in touch. Absolutely. All right, now bless. All right. Take care. All right. Peace.